Good day, and thank you for joining us for ESA's 2020 Annual Meeting Live Stream Opening Plenary Session. Please welcome the following. ESA President Alvin Simmons, USDA ARS. Vice President Michelle Smith, Corteva. Vice President-Elect Jessica Ware, the American Museum of Natural History. Past President Bob Peterson, Montana State University. Treasurer Faith Oy, University of Florida. Incoming Vice President-Elect Mariana Aline, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Once again, ESA President Alvin Simmons. Hola. So what do you? Ni hao. Bonjour. Shalom. Merhaba. Konnichiwa. Hello, I welcome you all to the opening plenary session on the first day of the live stream of the first virtual annual meeting of the Entomological Society of America. This is exciting. We are so happy to have you come on this journey with us to create this virtual event and are thankful for all of our speakers who have created engaging presentations remotely and from home. We, just as we did for ESA members during the 1918, the 1919 pandemic, we are fortunate to be able to meet during the 2020 pandemic to share the science of entomology and related fields and to interact. The pandemic, of course, has provided many challenges, but it is essential that our science continues to move forward. The theme for this meeting is entomology for all. And my apology for the technical difficulties, but we will continue now. The theme for the meeting is entomology for all. More comments about the theme later. Next. We have so much content online, both scientific and fun. I hope you will be able to glance through the program. Here are some of the data about our 2020 meeting. There are over 3,000 registered participants from 51 different countries. We have 87 symposia, 37 are live streamed, and 50 on-demand symposia. Of the 1,791 presentations, 519 are by students in student competition. And of the 514 posters, 148 posters and 21 infographics are in student competitions. In addition, we have 170 network video chats. Next. For the first three days of the on-demand part of the conference, which started last Wednesday, there have been lots of views with presentations, sections, and event views that were over 30,000 on Wednesday, over 24,000 on Thursday, and over 17,000 on, on Friday. Next. I'd like to say a big thank you to the government board of the ESA who has gone through many challenges of a difficult year, but yet they have been quite professional in engaging in various issues of importance to the society. Next. Also, a big thank you is extended to the ESA staff. They're priceless. Uh, in fact, I would rank them as being one of the top ranked staff of a scientific society. 
Next. A big thank you to the program co-chairs of the uh, ESA meeting. Uh, J.C. Chong, Clemson University, Teresa, Teresa Pitts Singer, USDA ARS, Logan, Utah. Next. As we customarily do during our ESA uh, meeting, we pause to say, we could recognize those who have passed away during the past year. And that includes S. John Barquet, Ko Chun Chin, Russell W. Clausen, Douglas A. Craig, Terry L. Irwin, Matthew Charles St. Martin Herman, Marjorie, Marjorie A. Hoy, Amy Joy, Janvier, Pierre H. A. Jolivet, Peter J. Landolt, Dean E. May, David Pimentel, Richard L. Ridgeway, Dennis R. Ring, Arun K. Sin, Stephen J. Sebold, Daniel A. Strickman, Theodore William Suman, Michael C. Thomas, Gary D. Thompson, E. Craig Turner, Jr., Samuel G. Turnitseed, William E. Walton. In addition, the entire entomological community has experienced lots of infections or the households have received infections from COVID-19. And unfortunately, some of those also have passed. But we, as a society, will continue to move forward. Next. I would now like to spend a few minutes providing the presidential address. And I'm delighted to share that the state of the ESA is good. Next. I'd like to take you on a short journey of an entomologist and then followed by some diversity, inclusion, and fairness in ESA and some concluding remarks. Next. I grew up on a small farm in outside of New Bern, North Carolina. And this was in the community of Tuscarora Rims. Small unincorporated communities the name Tuscarora is from an indigenous population that used to be throughout Eastern North Carolina. I was number five of nine siblings. Dad has now passed, but it was this foundation of working together as a team to accomplish a common task or goal, which was essential to me even to this day. We were all unique, but yet we had lots of commonality. Next. My siblings and parents supported me as my interest in science in general and entomology specifically. My first degree, like many of you, was not in entomology. In my case, it was biology. Next, all of my graduate work was in entomology. 
at the University of Kentucky. My co-mentors, Bobby C. Pass and Kenneth V. Jurgen. Bobby Pass was, was an ESA fellow and past ESA president. He's now deceased. Kenneth, Ken Jurgen was an, is an ESA fellow and a past ESA program chair. These were, in my opinion, model mentors in which they wanted to not only ensure that I had the academics that was necessary, but they went beyond, such as development of the social person. They, like me, were hard workers. And so we mesh in that arena. But also, they continued to remind me, metaphorically, to do take time to smell the roses. Yes, I enjoy my work as an entomologist, but also, indeed, I do enjoy taking time to enjoy life. Next. My first job after graduate school was with USDA ARS, in which I was located in Tipton, Georgia, at what used to be called the Inset Biology and Population Management Research Laboratory. And I was fortunate in having colleagues who were genuinely interested in sharing their expertise and entomological knowledge with me. And as I have illustrated here, my first permanent hire, as a, in this case, as a technician, I'm gonna try to model the example that I had from my mentors in mentoring my technician. And I carried this with me throughout my time with USDA in mentoring students, postdocs, and technical support. Next, please. Now, let's take a brief comments about diversity inclusion and fairness within ESA. Next. As I mentioned, the theme is entomology for all. Next. When we talk about entomology for all, we look at a big umbrella. We talk about the people. We talk about the entomological subject. The people are diverse. As I know it before, we have membership around the world. We have members in over in 87 different countries. And yet, they, the members are each unique, but yet have the commonality of entomology. And we have so many different subjects uh, that we're, we, we study. Everything from A to Z, from ants all the way down to the raptor. Next, please. And speaking of our members, we have over 7,000 members. About half of these are full members. Students consist of almost 30%. Next, please. At this meeting today and this week, we have over 3,000 participants. About 15% of these are international. Students consist of slightly the largest category, percentage wise, 37%, followed by full numbers. Next. I'd like to just briefly mention the three strategic principles of ESA. The science of entomology is global. And as such, ESA is global. As I know before, we have members in 87 countries. 
entomology. ESA has to increase its influence on policy. We have had quite a number of legislative successes on different policies, including the K. Hagen Tech Act, uh, which uh, passed uh, back in, enacted back in December of 2019. And we have an active group of science fellows who are, along with others, uh, trying to help share the interest of entomology of those policies which are related. And entomology, yes, a, has a social responsibility to develop all members. We've established two new leadership and honors committees. We have a new uh, PAC initiative, the professional um, advanced uh, career training initiative. Next. For those two uh, leadership, those two committees, one on awards and honors canvassing, uh, which is in essence to help bring more people uh, to, to be nominated for awards and honors, and especially to help see out and encourage a diversity of individuals for these awards and honors. Similarly, for the Committee on Leadership Development, this committee is to help encourage the and identify potential leaders of the, our society. It is essential that we have a pipeline of leaders uh, for the future. In addition, anyone, any member can be considered for a leadership position. Next. I'd like to talk briefly about some old and new. The entomology trivial game uh, has been around since the early 1980s. This year, we changed the name to Entomology Games. Uh, we did this to be more inclusive of us today as our society. The, we have a, a publication that ESA produced called Memoirs of Black Entomology. This year, we, for the first time, this was for sale, but this year we are providing this free to all ESA members. This publication highlight and what will develop to help encourage those underrepresented in entomology and science. And today, I do know that there are some departments that are using this as a training tool uh, for their departments. And in which reflects on the different challenges that some of our members, in this case, uh, Black entomologists have faced. And it helps us all to more understand and to embrace the challenges that different components of our membership do face. Next. Each month of the past 12 months, I've written in the ESA newsletter, e-news, an item in the president corner. And I utilize the opportunity to highlight some of the national recognition in regard to diversity. And that's include Black History Month, Women's History Month, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, LGBTQ plus Pride Month, Women's Equality Day, Hispanic Heritage Month, Disability and 
Employment Awareness Month, Veterans Day, Native American, American Heritage Month. All of these are components of our membership. These are components of who we are as an entomological society. And so as I encourage during in those newsletter, do encourage us to continue to embrace the diversity of our, our membership. Next. I'm just a few concluding remarks as we continue to look, move forward with our society. We must continue to look for ways in which we embrace the new science and technology. We must look at ways how we can just improve ourselves as a society. And I can assure you that the next president of ESA, Michelle Smith, will continue to lead us forward. Next, we in ESA are a big umbrella and we welcome all. The membership of ESA is huge and diverse. And there are many benefits from being a member. And you can ask my daughters, Frances and Duchess, because they too are relatively long-term ESA student members. Next. But we are all part of the entomology family. We are entomology for all. Thank you. I would now like to introduce with my pleasure, the next speaker, which is the executive director of ESA, Chris Felton. Chris has worked with ESA in many aspects of management during the past 20 years, including science policy, certification, membership, data management, and strategy. Chris has led our society for just one year, but we are delighted to have had someone, to have someone with his knowledge, experience, and passion to lead our, to lead our society through this most challenging and difficult year. Chris' education and background is in marketing. And before joining ESA, he previously spent eight years in the newspaper industry. Chris was born in Fargo, North Dakota and grew up in Morganton, West Virginia. He now lives only a short walk to ESA headquarters. And now, without further ado, please welcome Chris Stelton. Thank you so much, Alvin. And thank you so much for sharing uh, your, your, your history and your journey to, to the leadership of ESA with us. Um, I, I'm delighted to be in this new role and uh, thank you all for attending this first ever ESA virtual annual conference. And let's get started. I think the, probably the best place to start though is, is a quick reminder about everyone uh, about the code of conduct. And ESA does have a code of conduct for all of our events. Um, and if you are at all concerned or confused or uncertain about what that means in a virtual setting, please do look at it online. Uh, this is something we do take seriously as we respect, expect everyone to treat each other as professionals that we know you are. All right, so as I was trying to figure out how to frame this conversation and this presentation, um, I borrowed this meme from Twitter and perhaps you've seen it and it's a little self-explanatory from what you see on the screen there, uh, how it started and how it's going. Uh, and for me, how it started was a pretty full year of expect, expected travel to branch meetings and allied society meetings, the International Congress, visits to various academic departments across the country and how it's going is absolutely nothing like that. 
Um, but it really got us thinking and trying to figure out how do we use this disruption to advantage and how can ESA be a better society going forward because of this pandemic, which is a little bit of non-traditional thinking, but really the staff and the, and the governing board have all really embraced this. And I found myself thinking about fulgurites. If you are not familiar with it, a fulgurite is the mineral oil that's created when lightning strikes sand or soil or some other soft material. And what I like about that is there's a literal physical transformation that happens when this bolt from beyond strikes and you take something and make it into something else. And I think that's a really good metaphor for what we're, we could do here with ESA. Nobody expected this pandemic. Nobody saw this coming. How can we use it to advantage now that, that it has happened? So that's what we're thinking about. Uh, I think perhaps most obviously the biggest story of the year is simply that. Uh, this has disrupted everything that we do. Uh, we've been reinvented lots and lots and lots of things about the way that we do um, uh, our business here at the society as a result of this pandemic. Um, but I think we'd be remiss in not acknowledging the fact that there are lots of other pretty big stories that happened this year, things that we really all should be pretty proud of. Um, Alvin mentioned the etymology games, the renaming there. Um, our journal submissions are up. And Journal of Insect Science, for example, has have had its most number of submissions since it became part of the ESA family. Uh, we were able to support the ENTO POC with 100 free student memberships. American Entomologist won an industry leading uh, redesign award. We had a successful elections this summer. Our, um, our executive committee, for the first time in ESA's history, is majority female. And next year, for the first time ever, ESA's presidential line will be 75% female. So that's all pretty exciting. Um, our seventh cohort of science policy fellows were selected. Our, uh, we launched a brand new certificate program in public health entomology. And so lots of exciting things going on. And uh, this graphic at the center, um, we were able to launch a brand new member support fund, repurposing some of that not spent travel that I had this year, and instead using it to support members who are having a financial difficulty because of the pandemic. So lots of exciting stuff going on and none of the work that we're doing would have been possible were it not for this ESA staff. Alvin mentioned everybody as well. Um, I have been on staff about 20 years at this point and I'm honored and uh, quite a bit humbled to be leading in this new role. Um, I do want to shout out, we've got four new faces on our team this year. So if you see any of them in the chat rooms throughout this annual conference, please do give them a welcome. Uh, and also we have three folks that were promoted this year and really um, all well-deserved. And this is probably a pretty good time to pause and also just do a strong and special shout out to the meetings team. Um, I don't know if you have any idea about the amount of work that went into this, but the meetings team pretty much reinvented our business model in a couple of months. So everyone on staff had a fantastic year, uh, but really like we, we really all owe a debt of gratitude uh, to, to the meetings for carrying a lot of weight this year. So what are we doing financially? Over the 20 years that I've been here, we have had a move toward diversification of our revenue port portfolio. And we've moved now to a point that only about a third of our revenue comes from publications. And that is exceedingly important as we move to a time when we know our revenue is going to be disrupted because of our uh, the changing nature of our relationship with Oxford University Press. We know this is coming. Now, we're well positioned to withstand this disruption as we get to the end of our first term contract, but it will be disruption. And so what we need to be thinking about is how do we get additional revenue into the society as a result of this transformation that we're seeing. Um, you can see in the center of the screen there, we know we're going to drop that revenue in pubs. Well, where do we make it up? How do we account for that? And we think there's a lot of different areas. Meetings and membership is a little disrupted right now because of the pandemic, but that will rebound. Another area that we're looking at and, and think there's lots of opportunity is on the left side of the screen there, the executive and governance. And that's programs that don't bring in revenue, but are incredibly important, like our science policy and advocacy, and also programs that do bring in revenue, like our certification programs. So you'll hear more about that as the uh, as 2021 continues. But I think there's just a lot of pretty exciting things on the horizon as we uh, as we use this lightning strike of the pandemic and really build something new for the society going forward. And that's all part of our annual cycle. This is just what we do at the society. Uh, my predecessor, David Gamble, uh, showed this kind of slide before. I made it prettier. Uh, but what it does, this, the idea here is that this is our annual cycle. This is the things that we do. And it's the mission of the society that drives that flywheel forward. And as it spins, it throws off the energy that becomes the operational success that we enjoy here as a society. 
I would also like to very much acknowledge our corporate partners and a lot of the work that we do. In fact, none of the work we, we do would be possible without the great work that they've provided to us. Uh, Bayer and Corteva are gold partners for the year. BASF, Syngenta, and SC Johnson are silver partners for the year, as well as all the other partners and, of course, the exhibitors that are in the exhibit hall. And uh, we're really grateful to all of them for the work that they have done. And that is what I had to present to you this, this morning. Um, if you have questions for me, I would love to be able to entertain those. On Thursday, I'll be hosting a video chat at 9 a.m. And also, we'll be doing a town hall session at 5 o'clock uh, on Thursday as well. So thank you so much. And now just a, a few more words from some of our, uh, our corporate partners. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 ESA Annual Meeting. I wanted to uh, start off by just introducing myself quickly. My name is Ty Vaughn. I am the Global Regulatory Lead at Bear Crop Science. And I also wanted to thank the organizers of the event this year. Uh, this is unlike any year that we've ever had to deal with uh, for everybody, but I still think it's extremely important that we spend time as scientific organizations to connect. And so what looks to be a pretty sophisticated virtual event uh, coming over the next several days, um, I'm just really happy to see that we continue to do these things. And I think in the field of entomology, it's even more important when we look at the goals that we have as a society for understanding sustainability, for understanding biodiversity. Um, the research that we do in this field feeds right into that. So whether we're talking about new technologies to control insect pests or vectors of disease, uh, understanding the impact on biodiversity or, or pollinators themselves, the work that we do in this field is that important to our sustainability commitments. And so what I'd like to do now is to introduce a short video from Bear that highlights a little bit of what we're thinking about in terms of sustainability and, um, and enjoy the video and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Stay safe. We're all facing some very challenging times with the COVID-19 pandemic, which is a real crisis. And sometimes we forget that the biggest crisis that humanity is facing is actually related to climate change. That's why we at Bayer have set really ambitious sustainability commitments, because our goal is to help make agriculture part of the solution to climate change. We have to make our global food systems more sustainable. It's our responsibility to the next generation, to our customers and to ourselves. This means reducing our environmental footprint while still managing to produce affordable, nutritious food for the world. We can help redefine the value of farming and growers can generate revenue for adopting climate smart practices. Together, we are jump-starting a new era of sustainable agriculture. We want to ensure we are offering growers tailored solutions and recommendations that maintain the protection they need for their crop while reducing environmental impact. For all our commitments, we are measuring and tracking progress on the one hand to improve business decision-making but also to provide the public with complete transparency into our efforts. At Bayer, we're working really hard to shape the future of agriculture for the benefit of farmers, consumers, and the planet. And through this, we're gonna bring our vision to life, health for all and hunger for none. Hi. I'd like to begin today by thanking the Society for giving Corteva AgriScience a few minutes at, the, at this opening plenary session to make comments. My name is John Fitt. I lead R&D operations for Corteva AgriScience. I'm also an entomologist, and I've been a member of the Entomological Society of America since 1981. In truth, I wish I weren't making these comments to this tiny camera at the top of my laptop computer, but that's the virtual world that we live in today. And regardless of the format, it's important that as scientists, as entomologists, we have a forum that allows us to come together to share ideas, to increase our networks, find ways to collaborate, and advance the science of entomology. I think entomologists are unique. One of the things that makes us unique is a fascination with the science and a persistent curiosity. 
Gatherings such as this offer us the opportunity to have the conversations, to advance the science, to see opportunities to collaborate. It is part of the fundamental mission of the society. But for the society to achieve its mission requires the engagement and the contributions of its membership. That's a message I'd like to leave with you today. Find a way to get involved, to give back, to help the ESA deliver on its mission of advancing the science of entomology. Corteva has been a champion of the ESA for decades, reaching back into our heritage companies. And again, for the society to be effective, it requires the contributions and the engagement of its membership. So find a way for you to get involved. You can support your section, your branch, the national meetings, be a member of a committee, run for an elected office, or be a judge. There are many avenues that offer you the opportunity to give back to the society. And speaking of entomologists serving the society, I'd like to introduce to you now my colleague, Marlon Rice. Many of you will recognize Marlon as a past president of the Entomological Society of America, and more recently for his contributions to the American Entomologist, where he has published his interviews with legends of entomology. Marlon is an, ex is an excellent example of scientists giving back to the society. Marlon, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Marlon Rice and I'm currently working as the R&D Academic Engagement Leader at Corteva AgriScience. Like John, I'm disappointed that we can't be together today and I hope you and your families are well during these very unusual times. Throughout my 41 year entomology career, I've held many different roles, both in my day job and within ESA. And in that time, one thing that has stood out is the power of collaboration. I see this every day at Corteva as our researchers work across the company to develop solutions that are integrated for farmers. And I see it in the students we work with around the globe as they partner with us on projects like the Plant Science Symposia Series, which help us drive interest at the universities in agricultural science topics, such as entomology. And I see it in the members of ESA as we work together to advance entomologists and the important entomology work that they do on every continent. But you know, ultimately, whether it's our work at Corteva, students' university research, or participation here at ESA, none of us can do it alone. So as we start this annual meeting, I encourage you to look for opportunities to work together. Now, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult when we're not passing each other in the halls or enjoying meals together or rubbing elbows in crowded rooms, but together we can continue to drive progress across our science to ensure a bright future for entomologists for years to come. Thanks for listening to my message and enjoying the annual meeting. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Ty, John, and Marlon. Honors and awards are good ways for us to recognize the outstanding accomplishments by our colleagues. Please join me in recognizing our colleagues for special honors as presented in the following video. Join us in recognizing the recipients of this ESA Honorary Members and ESA Fellows. Honorary membership acknowledges those who have served ESA for at least 20 years through significant involvement in the affairs of the society that has reached an extraordinary level. Dr. May Berenbaum, a faculty member of the Department of Entomology at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign since 1980, May Berenbaum has been head since 1992 and Swanland professor since 1996. Most of her 300 plus scientific papers are about insects. An ESA member since 1981, she served as its president in 2016. Dr. Michael Ivey. Michael Ivey is an insect systematist at Montana State University, where he has been on the faculty since 1985. He served as ESA president in 2005 and represented Section A on the governing board from 1997 to 2002. An ESA member since 1978, he has been active on many committees and service roles. 
Dr. Michael Merchant, BCE. Mike recently retired after 31 years with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. An active ESA member since 1982, Mike was especially involved with the certification program and led establishment of the first associate certificate entomologist category for pest control. He also co-authored the popular ESA study guide for ACE candidates. Gary Mullen is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology at Auburn University since 1975. His specialty is medical veterinary entomology. He has been an ESA member for 51 years and is widely recognized as lead editor of the book Medical and Veterinary Entomology, Mullen and Durden, EDS. Lisa G. Nevin, PhD, is the research leader of the USDA ARS in Wapato, Washington. She received her BS from the University of Florida and PhD from the University of Notre Dame. She works in environmental physiology, molecular biology, post-harvest quarantine treatments, insect thermal physiology, insect transgenesis, and ecological niche modeling. The designation of ESA Fellow recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions to entomology. Carol Anelli's scientific literacy courses help students gain skills to make evidence-based informed decisions and participate in social and civil discourse. She enjoys interdisciplinary approaches and offers courses on the history of biology, entomology, and evolutionary thought. Anna Comstock, B.D. Walsh, and Charles Darwin continue to captivate her intellect. Dr. Barrias Murray received her M.D. from Universidad Francisco Moraquín de Guatemala and her Ph.D. from the University of Arizona. She did postdoctoral training at Harvard University and the European Molecular Laboratory in Heidelberg. She joined the National Institutes of Health, NIH, in 2003 and became NIH Distinguished Investigator in 2016. A quote from David Dame, I share this ESA recognition with many colleagues around the world with whom I have endeavored to find environmentally friendly methods and products for control of arthropod-borne disease. I am indebted to the USDA Agricultural Research Service, USAID, industry, academia, IAEA, and WHO for support of this pursuit. Dr. Richard L. Helmick. Dr. Richard Helmick has 42 years of research experience in entomology and is an internationally recognized leader in the environmental risk assessment of genetically engineered crops and insect resistance management. He has also made important contributions to understanding pollen hoarding behavior of honeybees and mating biology of Africanized honeybees. Dr. Philip Keller is Emeritus Professor of Entomology after a 45-year career at the University of Florida. His extension, research, and teaching interests merged integrated pest management into the urban pest management industry. He has mentored 83 graduate students who have gone on to careers in academia, government, and industry. Catherine Loudon is a faculty member at the University of California, Irvine, and a longtime member of ESA. Her interdisciplinary research in physical biology biomechanics, she is particularly interested in insect sensory systems, biomimetic design, and microfabricated physical pesticides. Her innovative teaching has been recognized by teaching awards. Dr. Corey Moreau is the Martha N. and John C. Moser Professor of Arthropod Biosystematics and Biodiversity at Cornell University and the Director and Curator of the Cornell University Insect Collection. Dr. Moreau's research focuses on the evolution and diversification of ants and their symbiotic bacteria. In addition, Dr. Moreau is also engaged with efforts to increase diversity in the sciences. Dr. J. A. Rosenheim is a distinguished professor in the Department of Entomology and Nematology, University of California, Davis. He is internationally known for his research on the ecology of insect parasitoids and predators, insect reproductive behavior, and the application of big data or eco-informatics methods in agricultural entomology. Dr. James Truman is Professor of Biology Emeritus at the University of Washington's Friday Harbor Laboratories. His interests are in how hormones control nervous system development and behavior of moths and flies and on the mechanisms that underlie the evolution and diversification of the insect nervous system. 
Dr. Susan Weller is the director of the University of Nebraska State Museum and professor of entomology. She is internationally recognized for her research on the evolution of Arctean moths and other noctuity, as well as nationally recognized for her administrative leadership to promote entomology and science education. Congratulations to all of this year's honorees. Well done. It is my pleasure to introduce the first dynamic keynote speaker, Dr. Ray Wheeler, who is coming to us live from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Ray is related to a distinguished entomologist who was an ESA fellow and a world-renowned authority on ants and other social insects. Ray will share more about this entomologist shortly. Ray Wheeler is a plant physiologist and senior scientist at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, where he leads the Advanced Life Support Research Group. This includes controlled environments such, um, such as studies on vertical farming uh, with crops for food and oxygen production, CO2 removal, and wastewater processing. Ray has been co-investigator for several space flight experiments, and he has authored more than 260 research papers. He has received NASA's Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal, the USDA ARS Morrison Distinguished Lecture Award, the American Society of Gravitational and Space Research Founders Award, the AIAA Jeffries Award for Aerospace Medicine and Life Science Research, and currently, Ray served as the vice chair for the Life Science Commission on COSPAR, the International Committee on Space Research. And now, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Ray Wheeler. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. And thank you to all of ESA for this opportunity to speak today. Um, can you see my screen okay? say here. Well, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, and what I will be uh, talking to you today about is bioregenerative life support systems for space. Um, as uh, Alvin mentioned, I am a plant physiologist. I am not a, uh, an entomologist, um, but hopefully uh, you'll be patient with me today and, uh, and, and I can present you some interesting information on the use of biology for space exploration. So now I'm having some trouble advancing my screen here. Okay, we're back. I apologize for the technical difficulties there. Uh, again, thank you to Alvin Simmons and the ESA for this opportunity to speak. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you today about is the use of biology and what we refer to as bioregenerative approaches for life support in space. And as Alvin mentioned, I'm a plant physiologist. But on the next slide, I, I will say that I do have a a relative, my great great uncle Will, William Morton Wheeler, was an entomologist and uh, spent many years uh, at various institutions and ended up at Harvard 
focused largely on, on ants in his career, but you can see throughout his career, he referred to himself as an embryologist, a zoologist, a morphologist, an entomologist, and finally a myrmecologist. But I've also added at the end there, he, he was very philosophical and uh, uh, I, it's been entertaining to read some of his papers from even as many years ago. So I hope you'll, you'll be uh, a bit kind to me on my Uncle Will's behalf, even though I'm not an entomologist, uh, uh, he was a pretty good one. So next slide, please. So let me talk to you about some things that I do know a little bit more about. Um, and that's uh, humans in space flight. Here you see a picture of the International Space Station. And some of you might have heard on the news last night, uh, there were four more astronauts launched from Kennedy Space Center and they should arrive at the International Space Station by tonight. This was, the launch occurred about five miles just north of where I'm sitting right now in my office. So next slide. So keeping humans alive in space is very serious business. Uh, you have to think of what they need to stay alive. Things like oxygen and food and clean water. And you see some mass numbers there for inputs. Uh, if you add water for things like uh, laundry and hygiene, it could be something like 30 kilograms of mass per day. And at the same time, we're producing waste, things like carbon dioxide, metabolic solid wastes, water, waste water, for about a similar amount of mass. So you could see that very quickly, if you did this only through stowage and resupply, it would become prohibitively expensive over time. And so you really need to think about regenerative technologies if we push further into space and explore and stay longer. Next slide, please. And I don't expect you to, to read this, but I, I want to show this as to make a point. This is a diagram of the International Space Station that I just showed a picture of. But each of these colored icons represents some component of the life support systems that are spread all throughout the, uh, the International Space Station. Things involved with atmospheric regeneration, water management, drinking water, wastewater management, oxygen production, trace contaminant control. The point being, it's very serious uh, business keeping people alive in space. But in this case, what you're looking at here in the International Space Station, all these systems are physical chemical systems as it referred to, uh, mechanical and engineering approaches to generating life support. So next slide, please. But as biologists, many of us know that there are biological solutions to these same kinds of challenges. And that's where this term bioregenerative life support comes up. Uh, here, I just showed some simplified metabolic equations. In humans, we need food and oxygen. That's how we get our metabolic energy. And then we generate waste products like carbon dioxide gas and water vapor. And of course, we need clean water and we generate wastewater. Plants and other photosynthetic organisms can drive this reaction in the opposite direction but they need a lot of light energy to do this. So they can take the carbon dioxide and fix that into um, biomass. Uh, I show a fundamental unit of carbohydrate there. And then as a, as a waste product actually from the photosynthetic reactions, they generate oxygen. And at the same time, uh, they do use, they can use wastewater and evaporate that to provide a source of very clean water. So if you're, if you're uh, selective about the plants you choose, that biomass that you generate through photosynthesis could produce food as well. So you could use plants as a multifunctional life support system, uh, combination of systems. They also do produce inedible biomass, and I'll come back to that in, in later in the talk. So next slide. This has been studied for a long time, but perhaps it goes back farther uh, to uh, the works by Joseph Priestley, well known as the co-founder of uh, oxygen through his studies. And one of his studies where he put uh, mice and, and candles under a bell jar with plants, uh, I wanted to quote some of his uh, words here. These are Priestley's words. 
I've been so happy as by accident to hit upon a method of restoring air, which has been injured by the burning of candles, and I discovered at least one of the restoratives. It is vegetation. When I first put a sprig of mint into a glass jar, standing inverted in a vessel of water, it had continued growing for some months, and I found that the air would neither extinguish a candle, nor was it at all inconvenient to a mouse. Next slide, please. So, taking Priestley's ideas and carrying them forward, if we, if we can think about crops and plants for life support, what kinds of criteria do you need to consider? Well, you probably want things that are high yielding and nutritious, that's pretty obvious. We want crops that have a high har harvest index, that's an agronomic term uh, for the edible to total biomass ratio. That just intrinsically improves your food production capability per unit area. In space, we'll be, we'll be challenged in terms of available volume and growing areas. So we, we really need to think about dwarf and low growing crops. There are environmental considerations for the, for the plants and growing and the horticultural approaches. And then how do you process the plants as you generate food? Next slide. NASA has sponsored studies and selecting crops. Some of this is drawn from existing genotypes. On that left, you see the, the genotypic variation in rice that already exists, very dwarf varieties, along with some focused breeding. So an example of that is some wheat breeding work done at Utah State University, where they bred, uh, this is Bruce Bugby's group, uh, a dwarf wheat that's only about 40 centimeters tall, but has high yields. So this would be, uh, you know, ideal for space. Next slide, please. In addition to traditional breeding and selection from existing varieties, we can use modern tools of genetic engineering. Here's just one example where we've collaborated with USDA ARS researchers at the Appalachian Fruit Tree Research Station, where they, they uh, genetically uh, modified plum trees to overexpress a flowering gene. And you see a very small plum tree in a, in a four inch square pot there on the left that's already begun to flower only about 12 months from seed. So we have a range of tools that, that are available to us uh, that, can, that can get us different types of crops that could fit the constraints of space. Next slide, please. Well, some of the work that we've carried out at Kennedy Space Center over the years involved this very unique chamber. We called it the biomass production chamber. You see a picture of it there on the left. It was a former hypobaric test chamber that was converted to grow plants. Next slide. If you were to look inside of it, you'd see, in this case, soybeans, a layer of, or a shelf of hydroponically growing plants with a light bank above that shelf then another shelf of hydroponic plants with another light bank and so forth. Next slide. And we grew wheat in, the, in these tests. You see they were all grown hydroponically. When we removed the plants, there was no soil or anything to deal with. Next slide. Soybeans, as I showed earlier, in this case, I opened the floor hatch. You can see all four levels of the plants just barely there. Next slide. We could even grow root zone crops like potatoes. Potatoes are underground stems, storage organs. And when we would cut off the tops, when it was ready to harvest, we could roll the plastic covers of the trays back and you could see it was a very nice clean operation for picking potatoes. Next slide. Leafy crops like lettuce, of course, are a classic one for controlled environment production and, and that work very well in the system as well. Next slide. So that was, in my, to my knowledge, probably one of the first working examples of a vertical farm. And that began in the late 1980s and ran through the 1990s through the early 2000s. And I just wanted to fast forward to the present and show you some very modern and up-to-date commercial vertical farms. And you can see how far they've advanced in terms of the concepts that NASA began with in the late 1980s very sophisticated, very volume efficient operations. Next slide. So how do the plants work in closed systems like this? 
NASA's done studies, as have other space agencies. And you see here uh, a colleague of mine, NASA, Nigel Packham at, at NASA's Johnson Space Center, uh, lived for about 15 days inside this closed chamber with only wheat plants that provided all of his oxygen, only 11 square meters of wheat, and removed all the carbon dioxide that he exhaled. And as I mentioned, other space agencies have done similar studies. Next slide, please. So light is very important to all of this. Light is the, is the driver for photosynthesis. And so on this slide, on the x-axis, I show increasing light. It's just plotted as a daily integral. And then on the y-axis, I show the yields of all those crops that we grew in that large demonstration chamber. And you see that it's, it's, the yields are essentially a linear response to light. The more light, the more photosynthesis, the more oxygen you get, the more biomass you get. And just to kind of calibrate that, I show a bright sunny day on June 21st on Earth there at about 60 moles per meter square, and then a bright sunny day on Mars. And I know uh, firsthand that in the Northeast of the US, for example, on, on overcast winter days, you're down at about five or less on that scale on the x-axis. So Mars has quite a bit of light. Next slide, please. But most of our studies have proceeded on the basis of using electric lighting. And by far now the winter of that competition, you might say, in terms of the types of light are LEDs, light emitting diodes. And as it turns out, NASA's funded research at the University of Wisconsin patented this concept of using LEDs to grow plants. So it's a little bit strange that NASA would have a, a hand in this. And so you see pictures on the upper left, sort of the bare minimum combination of red and blue LEDs that you need to grow plants. But of course, the plants look purple, there's no green light. So you can add green light and then begin to see the green colors. And that maybe helps you in terms of remote sensing for stress and managing the plants. But LEDs now are remarkably efficient devices. They are in the range of 70 to 80% efficient in terms of power that you provide to them and then the radiant power that you get out. I, I think this is just remarkable in terms of how they improve. But this is really important for growing plants for life support systems for space because power is always limiting. Next slide. Please. If you do have available sunlight, perhaps you could use a sunlight or solar collection system like is shown here that was developed and placed on the roof of our facility at, at Kennedy Space Center. It shows a system that uses parabolic reflectors uh, that concentrate the sunlight which is then bounced off a secondary dichroic filter or mirror that then reflects it onto fiber optic bundles that convey the light down into the building into a protected plant growth chamber, as you see there. These mirrors then track the sun throughout the day and give you, uh, in our case, we were getting up to 40 to 50% of the incident sunlight delivered to a protected plant chamber inside the building. Next slide. But there's more to it than just food and oxygen for plants. Uh, and an example of this, I show here a slide of, of a husband and wife team that were at the US uh, Edmondson Scott South Pole Station in Antarctica in the overwintering crew. And there's a plant growth chamber there that be has become a very popular place to go just to relax. Imagine if you can uh, living in a place like the Antarctic in the winter where it's very dark in the winter, uh, very cold and hostile outside. This isn't too much different than going on a space mission uh, where you might uh, say for a Mars mission, it's nine months to get to Mars. When you get to the surface, you have to stay about 500 days until the planets realign in orbit and then another nine months back. So about a three year mission. So the plants in this case can provide a, a relaxing environment. You see green living things. You smell the aromas of the plants as they grow. You sense the humidity of their environment. You see bright light. And speaking of philosophical entomologists, E.O. Wilson has written of this concept of biophilia, where he hypothesizes about an intrinsic or an innate connection between humans and other living things. That it's 
very much part of the human condition to be around other living organisms. So this is really important to us for space missions. Are there ways we can keep the crew happy and keep their mood elevated and keep them performing at optimal levels? Well, perhaps having plants around can contribute to this. Next slide, please. So where are we today? On the International Space Station, for a number of years, we've been growing uh, leafy greens that are used by the crew. They consume them as supplements to their stowed food diets. You see pictures here of a plant chamber called Veggie. There are two of those on the plant on the International Space Station. And so we're learning how to do this in space right now. Next slide. So that could evolve perhaps into a larger scale system that could be used for Mars transit vehicles. Or maybe we could attach a, a larger module to something like the International Space Station or uh, a new proposed gateway that would be in what's referred to a cislunar orbit around the moon, where you could expand the growing area, or maybe even land one of these logistics modules, and then as you empty it out, convert it into a plant growth chamber, as shown in that upper right uh, photo there. This is a concept referred to as logistics to living. Next slide. A lot of people have speculated on what greenhouses might look like in space. You see some examples here uh, on the upper left, uh, uh, a moon colony where the, all the habitat structures, including a plant growth system or have a uh, local regolith, that's the soil piled up over it to provide radiation shielding. Or perhaps as you see in the center could be something like inflatable structures that are covered with ice to provide radiation shielding like on a Mars setting. And then maybe you might even design these types of plant growth facilities to integrate with human habitats to leverage that, that experience of biophilia and, and, and provide a more pleasant living environment for the human crew. Next slide, please. So insects in space, what are their potential roles? Well, we know, for example, that insects are used right now to pollinate crops and greenhouses, crops like tomatoes and peppers and strawberries. Is this a possible role for insects as we explore space? Perhaps. Next slide. Another one that's already being explored is the use of insects for food in space. The, con the uh, idea of entomophagy, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, this is a paper by a colleague, uh, Naomi Katayama. She's a food scientist at Nagoya Women's College in Japan. Next slide, please. And she kindly sent me these photos of uh, insect foods. And you see a, a, a picture there of a, a silkworm larva and, and a pupa. They're then used directly as human foods. I, I've tried to, my best to get a, a, a Japanese speaker to translate these uh, different labels here, but you can see uh, silkworms, uh, bees, locusts. So it's already happening. Could this be a way of converting that inedible biomass I showed on that early slide to get even more high value food out of the plant systems? Next slide. Please. In fact, the, a number of papers have been written on this. Uh, organisms like silkworm larvae, uh, black soldier fly larvae uh, that are good detritivores, could they be used to convert inedible plant biomass or other waste? Yellow mealworms, they've already been part of some studies done by the Chinese National Space Agency in a one year uh, life support test where they used all bioregenerative life support technologies, including plants and these insects to provide food and life support. Next slide, please. Roles of space, uh, insects for space, pollination, perhaps if we have enough foraging area for the different insects, conversion of inedible biomass. I think that's highly possible. Production of high value compounds. Could, the, uh, could we select uh, insects like termites to produce cementing compounds or binding compounds for the regolith that's on the surface? Or other uh, engineering the insects to, uh, to produce high value products or others, I, 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 I kind of ask that to you as a society. Next slide, please. So to all of ESA and entomologists around the world, come join us. Come join us as we push forward with human exploration into space. 
as we go on to exotic locations like Shackleton Crater on the South Pole of the Moon, where we might develop human habitats on ridge lines that get permanent light, only kilometers away from permanently shadowed areas that are hundreds of degrees colder and could have large reserves of water ice and other frozen organic volatiles. And then as we push on to Mars, the ultimate goal for human exploration for all space agencies around the world. Next slide. Come join us as we attempt a priestly experiment on Mars, where perhaps plants and insects and other living organisms will not at all be inconvenient to their human companions. Next slide, and my final slide. I wanna thank you to all of the ESA for inviting me to speak with you today. And I wanna thank my colleagues at Kennedy Space Center over the years for all their contributions they've given to help forward human exploration of space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray, for that invigorating talk. Quite frankly, I'm really excited about wanting to as an entomologist in space. <laughs> Please sign me up. We're welcome to take you on anytime. Thank you. So it is my pleasure to introduce our second dynamic keynote speaker, Dr. Shabanda Jacob Young. In addition to currently serving as the acting chief scientist of USDA, Shabanda is the administrator of the Agriculture Research Service, which is USDA's primary scientific in-house research agency. Shavanda previously served in several scientific leadership roles, including director of the USDA Office of the Chief Scientist, acting director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, also called NIFA, and science policy analyst in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. In these roles, Shavanda transformed USDA's scientific coordination and made a lasting impact on the conduct, quality, integrity, and access to science for customers, and also elevated the visibility of agriculture research globally. Shavanda is a native of Augusta, Georgia, and she holds master's of science degree and doctorate degrees in woods and, pe and paper science from North Carolina State University. So Shavanda is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, and a 2016 recipient of the Presidential Rank Award. And now, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Shavanda Jacob Young. Greetings, ESA. A special hello to honored guest Ambassador Kip Tom, ESA President and ARS's own Dr. Alvin Simmons, ESA Executive Director Chris Delzik, and the other ESA leadership. I am so pleased to be joining you this year to kick off the Entomological Society of America's annual meeting. Thank you for inviting me. I'm always pleased to speak to you in ESA. You have such a long and storied history of scientific achievement, collaboration, and collegiality. Professional scientific societies are a critical way for us to stay connected to each other, to drive our science forward, and to spark innovation through the meeting of brilliant minds. 2020 has been quite a year. It's unfortunate that we are not all together in Orlando, and I know for many of us, this feels like a real loss. 
What we've learned this past year in ARS, however, is that there is real strength and excitement in the virtual connections we've been forming. I'm confident that as you all progress through your meeting this week, you're gonna find new and exciting ways to connect and derive meaning from your virtual experience. You know how I know this? Because we are scientists. Scientists adapt and innovate. It's what we do. I love the theme ESA has laid out for this year's meeting, entomology for all. I appreciate the fullness of the theme, especially this year in our circumstances. In your theme, I recognize again, the innovation and adaptation that marks scientists and the insects entomologist study. So I think it's appropriate today to discuss what it takes to innovate and adapt and to realize revolutionary research. We've been given this a lot of thought in ARS in recent years. We have a history of innovation. I can go back to three luminaries, hall of famers and good friends of ESA to illustrate my point. First, Edward F. Nippling and Raymond C. Bushland. These two received the 1992 World Food Prize for their breakthrough development of the sterile insect technique and for eradicating the threat posed by pests to the livestock and crops that make up the world's food supply. In 1954, Nippling and Bushland, Bushland, Dr. Bushland, carried out the first successful test of their technique eradicating the screw run fly from the small island of Caraco. USDA with help from state governments and ranchers themselves would go on to eradicate the pest throughout the United States by 1982 and down to Panama by 2006, where today USDA helps maintain a border zone to prevent the reinfestation from South America. The eradication of the screw worm in the United States and Central America is estimated to have saved livestock producers and consumers billions of dollars. Nipplin's and Bushland's sterile insect technique continues to inform ongoing fights against disease vector in agriculture pests, including various species of mosquitoes, fruit flies, and the tsetse fly. Yet in their time, Nipplin and Bushland were not necessarily recognized for the visionaries they were. In fact, in some circles, they were mocked. Decades later, they were even recognized for the steadfastness with the Golden Goose Award. This award honors scientists whose federally funded work may have been considered silly, odd, or obscure when first conducted, but has resulted in significant benefits to society. The technique has been heralded as one of the only true original innovations in insect control in the 20th century and continues to inform ongoing fights against other agricultural pests and insects carrying infectious pathogens. Innovation's sister is adaptation, building on the work of others by employing the methods or techniques to a related field or a completely different end. Let me tell you a bit about Dr. Ernest Harris another ARS Hall of Famer that you will hear a lot about later in the ESA proceedings because he is the subject of this year's ESA Founders Memorial Lecture. Dr. Ernest James Harris is an internationally known scientist for finding innovative ways to control fruit flies that threaten crops around the world. His technologies have been key to eradicating foreign <clears throat> fruit flies in California, Florida and other US mainland states and keeping areas free of these pests that would require costly quarantines and interfere with millions of dollars of agricultural experts. He built on Nipplin and Bushland's work by devising the raising and release of sterile Mediterranean fruit flies in time to control their first invasion into California in the 1970s. The technique has effectively controlled the pests there ever since. Harris also developed innovative techniques for mass rearing a beneficial wasp for use as a biocontrol agent. This has since been used to control fruit flies in Mexico, Africa, Israel, Brazil, and several island nations in the South Pacific. He worked with the US Agency for International Development to control med flies in Tunisia and Morocco. He also earned a commendation from the Chilean government for his fruit fly eradication efforts that benefited farmers in Chile and neighboring countries. I would love to tell you more about Dr. Harris, one of the most interesting people I've met since I've been in ARS, but I don't want to steal Dr. Michelle Samuel Foo's thunder. Please tune into the Founders Memorial Lecture to hear more. 
these three people, these three scientists are luminaries. They didn't have a lot of resources. They were up against crises. They were mocked in some circles for their atypical approaches. So how did they succeed? What does it take to innovate, to build innovative and revolutionary research? I believe there are three keys, be prepared, push the envelope and pass the baton. I'll talk about each of these in turn, but let's start with being prepared. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing in ARS to build the foundation for innovation. I am the leader of one of the world's largest intramural agricultural research organizations whose roots extend back to 1862. That's when President Abraham Lincoln established our research mission within USDA. He mandated that the new department should conduct practical and scientific experiments to improve the quality and security of US agriculture. Ever since then, we've been carrying out that mission. And since a big part of that mission is to protect agriculture from emerging pests and pathogens, we count being prepared among our most essential jobs. We've always have, we always have our eyes forward, thinking five, 10 and 20 years into the future is the business of ARS crop production and protection national program leaders like Dr. Kevin Hackett, Dr. Joe Muyaneza, Dr. Tim Reinhardt, Dr. Tim Widmer, Dr. Jose Costa, Dr. Roy Scott, Dr. Peter Bredding, Dr. Jack Okamura, and our newest hire veterinary entomologist, Dr. Robert Miller. I believe we can't wait until tomorrow to prepare for tomorrow. If we do, we suffer lost productivity and opportunity when disaster hits. Yet when we are prepared, we have what we need when we need it. A fitting example of investing in the future to be prepared is ARS's Ag 100 Pest Initiative, which grew out of the international I5K effort to sequence the genomes of 5,000 anthropods, which is part of the Earth Biogenome Project. I'm sure most of you have heard of I5K and maybe some of these other projects. The Earth Biogenome Project sets the ambitious goal of sequencing all 1.5 million eukaryotes all plant, animal, and fungal species. This may sound impossible, with, but with advancements in technology, this would be similar in cost to the Human Genome Project, which cost about $4.7 billion. The cost of sequencing has just sharply um, reduced and sharply been decreased, but it's still not trivial. My point is, this isn't an initiative the scientific community takes on lightly. It's resource intensive, our most valuable resources being our time and money, but we know the investment is worth it. To have the genetic data we need when we need it will be invaluable. We can, count, we can all contribute. That's why I like this example so much. The Earth Biogenome Project taken on by the whole scientific community, the anthropod portion of that taken on in I5K by the entomologist, and then USDA ARS leads the charge on the 100 most important pests for agriculture. When we all do our part, we become greater than the sum of our parts. The partners in these projects know this well, such as the Earth, Earth Biogenome Project and I5K co-chair, Dr. Gene Robinson, an ESA member. Before I leave this topic, I thought you might like an update on the Ag 100 Pest Initiative. We were ecstatic when ARS scientists succeeded in sequencing the tiny spotted lanternfly insect, a new invasive species, one with a large genome, almost 10 times larger than the bee genome. Even better, the genome came from a single insect. I don't have to tell a room full of entomologists the significance of that accomplishment. This came out of the partnership we had developed with PacBio and has been made possible and made possible the goal that we set two years ago of sequencing 100 anthropods. This project has not been without its challenges, but we are for forging ahead. After mastering the small insect, we move to the large. Another success for the project was sequencing the Asian giant hornet. This is a large insect, so DNA should have been easy to get, but ARS scientists were able to get only one specimen to sequence. Fortunately, scientists found enough DNA from a tiny piece of insect thorax to sequence, using the knowledge gained from the spotted lanternfly project. This project set a new bar for speed of specimen capture to final sequence release, just weeks, compared to years, which is more typical. 
And let's not put away the Asian giant hornet completely. I have another story about it later in my talk. I'm told the desert locust is the project's next target. It has a monstrous genome and it's critical insect. It's a critical insect causing famine from the Horn of Africa extending as far east as Pakistan and India. Stay tuned to hear from Ambassador Kip Tom on the project and the topic later in the program. We make investment in projects like I-5K and Ag 100 Pest because we must, because if we don't have their results when we need them, it will be too late. We must have a strong commitment to being prepared. Similarly, we must support our collections. The ARS invertebrate germplasm collections include an estimated 46 collection of insects and arachnids at various locations throughout the country. These collections are highly valuable and supply essential support to efforts such as screwworm eradication. Major collections, each housing hundreds of thousands of accessions are located in Washington, DC, Logan, Utah, Stillwater, Oklahoma, and Newark, Delaware. I'll just mention a couple of these in more detail, although they are all fascinating. The U.S. National Pollinated Insects Collection in Logan, Utah is a world-class collection of bees and related wasps. The collection was started in 1947 and now includes more than 1.6 million specimens from around the world. The collection is located in DC at Smithsonian Museum. The relationship between USDA and the Smithsonian's Department of Systematic Biology at the National Museum of National History dates back to the 1880s when the agriculture insect collection was part of USDA. Early agricultural collections housed in the original agriculture department building in Washington, DC were transferred to the Smithsonian in 1881. The Smithsonian lab works closely with the Systematic Entomology Lab in Beltsville, Maryland, where scientists conduct systematic or taxo taxonomic research on economically important insects and mites. The lab does a busy, valuable service. This past year, they provided service identifications to protect US borders from invasive species and pests, completing 6,690 submissions representing 21,865 specimens and working with the Animal Plant and Health and Inspection Service, APHIS, to develop the fruit fly database, which contains 12,000 names and 37,000 host plants for more than 5,000 species of true fruit flies of the world. Let me give you an example of how these valuable collections help us be prepared. The ARS aphid collection from Stillwater, Oklahoma was used during a Russian wheat aphid outbreak in Colorado that damaged many fields. Specimens in the collection allowed scientists to quickly determine that the biotype was not a new introduction to the country. This saved time and helped the scientists understand pest resistant differences and produce solutions, including developing resistant cultivars. This is a notable example of having a resource available when we needed it. So the first key to building innovation and revolutionary research is to be prepared. The second key is to push the envelope. We must not be comfortable or complacent and we must not accept failure but persist until we are met with success. Some problems are particularly sticky. So we must change our narrative, our perspective, our approach. Our approach must continue to evolve. I'm excited about an innovative new program in ARS based on the world-renowned X Prize. For ARS X, the goal is to address problems that are socially worthy, intrinsically motivating, and nearly impossible to achieve with what we know today. ARS teams compete to develop high-risk, high-reward proposals targeting complex and impactful research issues. This first year, the challenge to scientists was to prevent or predict introduction of a pest or eradicate the pest or develop host resistance to the pest. We funded three projects on the challenge, a handheld device for assess assessing plant health, novel feed-based therapeutics for honeybees and delivering real-time crop pest or pathogen immunity. Two of those prize winners, by the way, are entomologists. There are so many exciting new tools on the horizons where I see we can push the envelope. The X Prize is famous for bringing existing technologies across disciplines to solve unfamiliar problems. We're using that approach in the fight against plant pests and pathogens too. Let me share a few prospects we are excited about in ARS. 
Drones are a tool already used often in agriculture. ARS scientists in Fort Lauderdale and Hilo are looking at ways to use drones to apply biological control agents in hard to reach areas. As you can see here in this video, the drone is being flown to an area where it drops a bag that holds a biological control agent. This lab has tested this technique with live insects and there was no difference in survival or the generation in, in the following year compared to more conventional releases. Another technology piloted by the Army for Mosquito Control is the use of photonic fences. The idea is that artificial intelligence will enable sensors to identify a specific, specific wanted insect and then zap it with a laser when it crosses the photonic fence. In the Army trial, integrated machine learning even enabled the system to differentiate a female from a male mosquito. Isn't that amazing? The application of this technology in ARS is toward a sticky problem indeed. We're looking at controlling the vector that carries the pathogens for citrus greening, a disease whose estimated damage over the past five years amounts to over $5 billion. In preliminary trials, when the Asian citrus psyllid was released from cages as shown on the right and flew across the hall to the attractants on the left, they were zapped and killed by the laser, which are pointed out with the red arrows on the white covering. Of course, the practicality of using this in a citrus grow would need to be determined, but proof of concept is encouraging and other applications can be visualized. Interference RNA or RNAi is also becoming a research topic that is just being explored for its possibilities in biological control. You are well familiar with RNAi. At ARS, we are looking at this as a tool to better manage invasive weeds and as seen here to kill a feeding insect. This preliminary experiment was successful when RNAi was applied as a soil drench, taken up by the plant and ingested by the feeding insects. The RNAi interfered with the insect's life cycle, thereby killing them. These are just some ways ARS scientists are pushing the envelope. There are many more, of course. I know there are many of you out there pushing the envelope too, and that's good news because this is the second key to building innovation and revolutionary research. Keep up the excellent work. For those of us not at the bench anymore, I challenge us, challenge us to remember that enabling high risk and potentially high reward transformational research sometimes requires moving, removing barriers that we aren't comfortable with. But the support we give our revolutionary researchers fuels the next greatest discovery or even the next basic work that will be built upon for the next 75 years like EF nippling sterile insect technique. The third and final key to building innovation and revolutionary research is to pass the baton. Forgive the track analogy, but I'm a former track athlete and it seems it's suitable um, to use this analogy here. When you run in a relay, you have to begin your leg. If it's not the first with accepting the baton from the previous runner and then end your leg by handing it off to the next runner. This sounds easy, but it is not. The forward runner is blind to the baton, running and reaching back, waiting for their teammate to place the baton surely into their hand. It's done at high speed and it is not easy. What makes it easier is practice and knowing your partners, both the ones in back and the ones in front and understanding in advance how it will go. Our innovations are nothing if they are not used. Our revolutionary research is nothing if it is sitting on our shelves. If we drop the baton or even do not bring it to the race, the next runner can't go on and finish for the team. I want to revisit the Asian giant hornet for a fitting example of taking the baton and passing it successfully. ARS scientist Jackie Ser Sereno took the baton from a colleague in her lab who worked for decades trapping and luring vespids. She set to work she set to work to lure and trap a new arrival, the Asian giant hornet. After systematically trying many lures in their repertoire, she successfully caught the hornet with the isobutanol and acetic acid trap. She handed the baton off to APHIS and the Washington State Department of Agriculture who tracked the hornets to their nest and successfully removed the nest from the corner of a homeowner's property for study. You may have heard about this one on the news, by the way, because it happened just a few weeks ago. You may also recognize Dr. Serrano's name because she is being honored here at ESA with the John Henry Comstock Graduate Student Award. I told you she was an ARS scientist, but I didn't mention was that she just officially started that job right around the time that the first Hornet was caught. 
Dr. Serena, thank you for the timely catch of that Hornet and thank you for the great example of successfully building on your colleagues' previous work and transferring technology to a partner. Having the foresight and vision to know how you will issue your findings before it is time to do so will help with the handoff. I encourage you to work with the experts to find technology partners before your work is mature, even at except in inception if possible. Early consideration will make it easiest to build the right partnerships to transfer your technology so that your baton handoff will be smooth. Nearing the end of the race, you may sometimes need some extra cheering on, so to speak, to finish strong. The ARS Office of Technology Transfer helps bring ARS research to the marketplace. One idea we have in ARS that has worked was to start an innovation fund to enhance the commercial potential of ARS studies and findings. This program funds projects near completion up to $25,000 to facilitate the adoption of their research by industry, universities, and other stakeholders. 10 rounds of proposals have been completed. In three years, 127 proposals have been funded. An excellent example of this program is the investment of $15,000 to conduct a market study on the industry's perspective of breeding better bees. This investment resulted in a contribution of $420,000 from an industry collaborator. So helping that final leg of the race is something that has aided our scientists and ARS finish strong. Well, those are the three keys to innovative research in my estimation. Being prepared, making key investments now so that you have what you need when you need it, pushing the envelope, looking to new technologies and other fields for tools to solve sticky problems, and third, passing the baton, taking the lead from those who have come before you and being vigilant to finish strong at the end by transferring your technology to the next leg or across the finish line. I've enjoyed sharing my thoughts on innovation and adaptation with you today. And I hope you have enjoyed hearing some stories from the pages of ARS history and current times. Whether from ARS of long ago like Dr. Harris or a new hire like Dr. Sereno, ARS entomologists have been one and the same with ESA for generations and will no doubt continue to be. We have a saying in ARS, we have a proud past and a promising future. ESA does too, and USDA ARS is grateful to continue to be so closely intertwined with such an esteemed organization. Thank you for your time today. Have a great meeting. I hope you learn a lot, meet some new colleagues, reconnect with old ones, and most of all, have a productive few days. Thank you for all you do for science. Thank you very much, Shavanda, for that invigorating talk. So before we close this plenary session, I have a few announcements. One, I'd like to thank everyone for their questions about the society during this session. And we'll answer these questions during the members town hall on Thursday afternoon. And so please do join us for that live event. The planning committee has been working on creating this virtual program. So be sure to check out everything we have to offer. We know there is so much on-demand content loaded already that we are giving you a few extra days to watch everything at your leisure. All content will be available for viewing through Monday, November the 30th. And that include the live sessions, which are all being recorded. And within 72 hours after being recorded, they will be posted. Again, day two will be available um, until November the 30th. For the next few days, please pay attention to the schedule for the live stream, which is an opportunity to watch these presentations in the comfort of your own home while engaging with fellow participants in the discussion feed. And you'll be able to ask questions to the presenters in real time. So this will be 
will be the only time that I will encourage you to quote unquote talk during a presentation. Please do follow, also follow the and contribute to all, all of the social media feeds in which you can find the links on the tile screen homepage for this virtual meeting. Up next on this same channel is the program symposium that was put together by ESA, ESA's Diversity and Inclusion Committee on best practices on diversity and inclusion from a variety of perspectives. So please do stay here to learn how you can make your workplace and laboratory more inclusive. The finals for the entomology game will be held this evening. We started with 23 different teams. And so the finals of that at site 10 quiz game will be this evening. Also on Wednesday, I'd like to invite you to Wednesday evening in which we'll have our Zoom dance party at 7 p.m. And I'd like to invite you to please bring your entire household for that, that party. And also for tomorrow morning at eight o'clock will be the women and allies of breakfast. And again, that's tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this plenary session and also to thank uh, my daughter's princess and her entire class, elementary class for, for um, joining in this session. And now we have uh, a break um, for our next session, which starts at one, one o'clock. And so that is in about 13 minutes. And so to, please do take, take a break, grab a snack, grab something to drink, uh, take a bowel break or whatever you wish to do. And do please uh, return. Uh, there are five different live channels uh, that we have this afternoon. And please pick whichever best you feel comfortable to enjoy. And so with that, do keep safe, do keep well, and I'll see you at one o'clock.